Hey, this is Sheon McKinney, cast member of HBO's Vice Principals, and you are watching Mr. Media. In the first couple episodes of the new HBO sitcom, Vice Principals, actor Sheon McKinney's moments on screen are short but sweet. Oh, and funny. Very, very funny. <laughs> By the way, my wife says you are her favorite part of the, of the show. Oh, tell her I said thank you. I appreciate that. So <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, McKinney plays uh, the cleverly the cleverly named Deshaun, a cafeteria worker at North Jackson High School, who is upbeat, professional, and maybe the only one on the school staff who sees its two vice principals, played by Danny McBride and Walton Goggins, for the assholes they truly are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the kind it's the kind of role where McKinney's character may, in some ways, represent the audience watching the show kind of raising an eyebrow or cock cocking his head askew at the mayhem the Veeps get into. Mm -hmm. Now, the show airs Sundays on HBO at 10.30 p.m. Now, for me, it's really cool to see McKinney back in action. He made his first appearance on Mr. Media way back in late 2007 as the star of an indie hip-hop film, Nemesis, which was later re-released re as Know Thy Enemy. I'm guessing Vice Principals is probably the big break that he's been waiting a decade for. <laughs> and Sheon McKinney, welcome back to Mr. Media. Thank you for having me, my brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while since Know Thy Enemy, huh? It, it has, it has. I was telling you uh, off-air that uh, I, I remember you because you were the first call-in. We, uh, we had the ability in 2007, the very first show, to do call-ins. And yeah. uh, your co-star, uh, Jeremy from uh, Nemesis, was, uh, was the guest. And he and I were talking, and I knew that people could call in, but nobody knew I had a show. Nobody knew what I was doing. <laughs> and there's a call, and who is it? It's Sheon McKinney, the, the co-star of the film. I mean, what, what the hell? So, yeah, you'll always have a special place in the, the history of this show. Well, that's good to hear, man. So how did you, how did you, uh, how did you land the vice principal's gig? Well, um, yeah, I had uh, just gotten back to L.A., actually, and I'll try to condense the story because I've had to tell it a lot since since uh, the, the show premiered and news broke, but I had actually moved back to Miami for about uh, maybe like a year and a half or so, and at that point, I was done with wanting to do, like, wanting to pursue film, and, you know, I still have a theater company in Miami uh, called Ground Up and Rising, shameless plug, but... uh you can find us, groundupandrising.org. We're doing shows this summer, so go see Good Work in Miami. But I went home, and I, I was kind of content with the idea of, you know, I have my theater company that I'm proud to be a part of. And I was actually in pursuit of being a police officer in, in Miami and um, did all the preliminary training so that I could see if I could get into an academy. And while I was doing all that, I was working at a law office, and my manager that I had when I was in LA, which they'll call me from time to time, you know, just to check up on me or to say, hey, this casting office that you went to uh, like a year ago, a month ago, they want to see you for this role. Can you just put it on tape? And I honestly felt like I owed him that much that I would still put things on tape, but I really had no inclination of ever coming back <laughs> like to LA. I was like, that's it. I'm done. But one day I was walking to the mailbox and I always tell the story this way because I think, I don't know, maybe somebody might need to hear it, but I was walking to the mailbox to see if I had gotten into the, uh, it might've been the state troopers or, or something because I was applying everywhere and they had denied me. And I was on the phone with my manager at the mailbox and he was like, Hey, this audition, you put on tape for this one thing and they want to see you in person. Can you fly back out just for maybe like four or five days? And honestly, I was like, I can't, I can't afford that. Like, I'm not making a lot of money at this law office. You know what I mean? So, uh, but he was like, you know, I'll, I'll meet you halfway on it. So I came out to LA for what I thought was going to be about maybe like four or five days just to do the audition. And while I was here, my best friend, Bashir Sylvain, the tremendous actor, Bashir Sylvain, said, uh, you know, let's go to church. And I'm like, I'm always game. You know, I, my, my faith is very important in my life. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go. And we go to this church while I'm while I'm here waiting to hear back from this audition, which wasn't vice principals. It was another another audition. Um, but I'm in this. I'm listening to this sermon, and there's a guest speaker at this church, and he keeps saying the whole time, "It's time for you to make a move. You know, it, it's time for you to act." 
on your faith. And I get you can listen to any sermon and think, oh, my God, Jesus is talking to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> you can do that anywhere. But, it, you know, certain things were sticking out. The, the guest speaker was from the Bahamas. My, my grandmother is from the Bahamas. And he and I'm you know, this is here in L.A. And then he's talking about when he lived in Miami and being in Miami. And I'm like, OK, like whatever. He closes his sermon just just by saying um, it's time for you to move. It's time for you to act upon your faith. Whatever obstacles you have before, he's like, God will send an earthquake to get rid of all your obstacles. And I was like, okay. I go home to my manager's place later that night, sleeping on his couch, and the entire apartment starts to shake. <laughs> I'm not I cannot make this up. I am not kidding you, but it's not, now for a lot of people, you can just say that's sheer coincidence. But I was just like, uh, okay. Long story short, I decided to stay. I didn't end up getting that part that I had come out here for. Come on, tell us what it was. What was the part? Uh, I think it was Manhattan. They, they they did a show about the Manhattan Project. Oh, I really? Think. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. But um, whatever. They really they really liked my audition, and the guy who was running the running the whole thing was a I, f I forget his name, so I don't want to mess. Honestly, I just forget his name. But he was a a big time. He's a big deal here. I I'm, I didn't know because I always tell my manager I don't really I don't really care who's in the room just give me the audition and I'll go I don't really people are people whatever you know and um, but whatever he really liked um, my work and he gave me some words of confidence he he was like you know you have a lot of talent you might wanna you might wanna stay you know he knew I was just here for the week he was like you might wanna stay so whatever I um, another friend of mine here ended up. Uh, calling me and he's like, yo, I heard you in town. And he says, I'm leaving for like a month. You can have my place in my car because I'm just going to be gone. And I was like, uh, oh, <laughs> okay. Like, you know, where was, I, I, where was all this good stuff before you gave up on Hollywood? Right. right? right. But, you know, but, and I, I'll, I'll end up tying, tying, tying all of that in. But <laughs> I mean, it was an obstacle that was just cleared. It was like, okay, go, go stay with this, you know, this dude's place, have your own place, have your own car something I never had when I was previously in LA. So I did and I took him up on it and I was staying there and then um, another member of our theater company in Miami was moving to LA, driving across country. He calls me towards the end of me being in my, in my buddy's place and he's like, hey, if you're considering staying in LA, I'm gonna be looking for an apartment if you wanna try to find one together. Prior to that, me being in LA, I could not find an apartment. I started to look around and I got approved like everywhere I went. Wow. So I was like, okay, my buddy gets here. We find a spot. I ended up um, getting an audition for another gig. And it was the first time I had ever tested for anything. For those non-actors, when you test for something, it's when they start offering you contracts and you see how much money you stand to make or lose. So <laughs> depending upon your financial situation, it's a very, very big, you know, big thing. But um, it was for a Netflix gig, and you know I tested for it. It went well, and I didn't get it. But um, a month and a half later is when I got the call for the vice principal's audition, and I went into one audition, and it was a casting office that knew me previously. I went into that audition. They thought I was great. They brought me back in, and I remember... Uh, sitting in the room and hearing that very distinct Danny McBride laugh. And I was like, oh, crap, like Danny's in the room. <laughs> and I go in the room, I read once, and then they go, okay, now you're going to read with Danny. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. So we read, and then he kind of drops the paper and starts the improv. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a theater kid. I'm used to improv. I've done street theater and whatnot. So we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe for a little bit, and then uh, that was it. And maybe like... A few months later, I no, a month later, I got the call that I had gotten the part. So that's, uh, yeah, that's how Vice Principals came to me in a very long, winded version. Oh, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a great story. And, it's you know, you could see how, you know, you could be sitting in the church and, and thinking, this guy is talking right to me. I don't, yeah. know, what, what a, I don't know what my friend is doing yeah. here. This guy is talking right to me. And then right. everything that happened, it just seemed to, you know. And yeah, how... Yeah. How long had you been in Hollywood before that, before you left to go back to Miami, when none oh, of that happened? 
Yeah, I was there about five years on on and off, like somewhat by coastal because I would go home to do a show every now and then for our company. And, um, you know, those five years that, that I was here before, I, I was never fully committed to the idea of, of doing film. Um, my, you know, Bashir is my best friend. He had moved here. My girlfriend at the time had moved, had moved to L.A. So I, I came here and I think it's very easy to come to L.A. and get, you can get bitter, you can get upset, and you can let this place, it, it, it can eat at you, you know? And if you aren't somewhat grounded or focused or don't know what you want, you just become, you know, you know, for me, I just wasn't in a good place. And, and I think I had to go home. I had to go home to kind of get regrounded and realize what, what I first started acting for, you know, and I was always in it because I felt like it's one of the very few things where I could express myself freely. And I know it's going to provide a platform to, you know, affect change. And if you let those things get convoluted and messed up, it's very easy to just get to LA and be like, this place is a madhouse. But, uh, when I came back here, you know, even when I started going to auditions, when I first got back, it was just so much easier because I think I let go of a lot of things, a lot of things I had to let go of and come back and get refocused. And, you know, now I can appreciate how beautiful LA is. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I didn't like things that I would look at every single day when I was here before. And just now I see it and I'm like, wow, that's, that's actually a beautiful place. You know, that's amazing. Now I got to ask you, cause I'm, I'm personally curious. I think mm -hmm. we connected on Facebook several months back the first, right. the first time. And I, I that had happened on my end because I was updating the old page for Nemesis Know Thy Enemy. Right. And I thought, yeah, I should see. Maybe Sheon is, is on Facebook now. And there you were. And, right. of course, by then, you already knew you had shot the first season and probably were already shooting the second season at that point. If that's, um, And so uh, had you been on Facebook before or is that Facebook kind of new for you? Uh, <laughs> that's a funny question. I had always had this adverse sentiment towards any social media because I don't know I, I think I grew up you know I'm born and raised in Miami for, for those who don't know um, and I grew up in Coconut Grove and Richmond Heights I have to say both places so they won't let me back in um, <laughs> but you know I grew up in a, in a sort of culture where it was like you mind your business you know what I mean like you mind your business and don't get involved in other people's business. So I remember when social media kind of first came onto the scene. For me, I was just like, that's, this just wasn't something I was into. And then when I moved to LA and, you know, at the behest of like my manager and, and close friends, they were like, well, you might want to get on social media. So I remember opening a Facebook page and just kind of, you know, having it. And then I shut it down for like, man, maybe like a year and a half. I shut it down, and then when I when I left Miami and I came back, you know, being in like a new mind frame, I was just like, yeah, I see, I see what it's for now. And then, yeah, that's when I put it back, put it back up. And it's it's nice, especially when you have a gig like you do now. Your friends can see, can hear about it, and they can. I, I've seen your friends are very supportive. And yeah, they love yeah. seeing good things happen to you. So yeah, it's it's one of those things. You know, people talk about. Yeah, I don't want to know what you had for lunch. <laughs> but, but but if you're my friend, I want to know that you're doing well, right? Right, yeah. yeah. And I guess that's the, you know, that's the way to look at it. Because even now, you know, having like a, a publicist and all this stuff, like it, it's very odd for me to even put that stuff on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Because, I mean, I, you feel like you're bragging on yourself sometimes. But, you know, I understand that you have to quote unquote you know, you have to navigate this business. You got to build your brand. You got to stay relevant and, and whatnot. And you know, and, and like you said, it's 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 very humbling to see how many people actually do truly, you know, support support you and care about you know how well you're doing. Absolutely. All right. So I should ask you a little bit about uh, Deshaun. Um, yeah. So I've been able to see the first two episodes. I I thought right. I, I thought I might have had access to more last night, but I didn't. So I've uh -huh. only seen the first two. My guess is that. Just from the prominence that your name gets in the in the opening credits, uh -huh. that as the series goes on, you you must have more and more to do. Am, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you just you just got to keep watching. They, they, you know, Deshaun is pretty much the boy. You, you hit it on the head. He's pretty much the voice of reason 
for for Danny's character, you know, and I think um, Deshaun's allegiance is always to, to Danny, to Neil Gamby, to the character, where I agree with his core principles as they are, but I don't agree with his tactics. Right, yeah. Know, <laughs> about <laughs> his, how he's going about things, and, and Deshaun, you know, he just, he, he keeps it real with him, you know, 100%, and I think we all have those friends, and even in a workspace, people that are just, they're just cool. They're themselves and extremely comfortable in their own skin, and they keep it 100% real with you. And like you said, he's kind of got that mind and that ear of the audience watching these two dudes go crazy and just <laughs> standing back and being like, you know, hey, that that ain't right. <laughs> There's a, a scene in the second episode. I don't want to give too much away, but the scene in the second episode where uh-huh. they break into a house. Yeah. Right? And we're watching it, and my wife and I have been both waiting for that moment where the show just kind of clicks. Oh, my oh, yeah. God, I thought she was going to fall off the couch. <laughs> I can't. I still can't. She said to me when we went to sleep last night, she said, she said, I don't know. It just started laughing at it, and it just was yeah. so funny. It was so, it was so bizarre, and she just laughed yeah. and laughed and laughed, and, you know, and you opened that show. You're yeah. at the very beginning of that show, and that was, that was funny. You know, you're, by the way, is, 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 was the character, was it, was it pot, or was it just a... Uh, what, what was he smoking there? I, I you have know what's know. funny is that I've gotten that question from the. I think I don't. I don't ever read any. Like I don't ever read reviews of, of anything that I've ever done. But somebody told me that there was a a review that said that Deshaun is really funny, even though he's high. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, when I don't ever recall like smoking marijuana during you know the character smoking marijuana during the show. But it's just supposed. To, it's just a vape. He's just smoking a vape. That's it. But if you want to think that it's it's marijuana, that's hey. Well, that's what. We, I mean, I, I don't know. You couldn't tell. He was smoking. Right. He was vaping at right. the beginning of the show. And who mm-hmm. knows? I mean, I know people can people can put pot in one of those. You can you know. Yeah. And so and and maybe maybe it's a very racist thing to think that he's on the job and he's he's <laughs> he's in the back smoking he's getting lit. Yeah. I mean, you know. Um. And actually, I wanted to ask you about that. The, mm-hmm. Both of those the lead characters, Goggins' character uh, Lee and uh, right. uh, McBride's character uh, Neil, um, they both are more Neil, I guess, so far. But they both appear yeah. to be racist. They both appear to be mis- misogynistic. Uh, but right. but th- that's on first thought. Now on second thought, I think they just hate everybody. They resent right. everybody, right? Yeah, and, and I think you know it's. Um... Obviously, with where we are now in society, the the political climate that we have going on, there's some that will watch, and I don't know, maybe they have an adverse reaction, you know, you know, to it. But I think, as a whole, when you can look at characters like that, and you can see how flawed people are, how flawed all of us are, and when when you can take that part of it and watch it, and watch that, no matter what they think, those two characters. There's a beautiful, smart, intelligent black woman in charge running the show, and they can do whatever they want, but that is what's going on, you know, and I think we also have to be able to laugh at some things and and see the humor, but you can see how outrageous they are. You know what I mean, and and yes, they are equally offensive. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> there are no holds barred. You know what I mean. They are equally offensive and unapologetic. You know about it. But I, I will say this: as you continue to watch, you will find yourself with every one of these characters finding something, I don't redeemable, relatable, and you know, I, I don't think, in my opinion, having been around for the duration of this show, that. You know, it, it's not written with the intent to, I'm going to flat out offend like this person. You're just watching two outrageous people, mm. you know, and of course you can liken them to, you know, a person who is 100% misogynistic or racist or whatever. But you have to watch to watch what unfolds and watch what, you know, what, what comes out of it. I'm curious to see what happens with uh, Dr. Brown, who is the, yeah. the uh, African-American woman who's the principal of the school. And yeah. uh, by the way. Dr. Brown, really? They had to yeah. be that obvious, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, I mean, that, you know, that's that's her name, Dr. Brown. And and some of these things, it's a credit to the writing that some of these things are, you know, meant for us to discuss and have discourse. And, and I think my opinion is always that we need to have open and honest discourse about these things or else all we ever do is just state an opinion very loudly 
and everybody stands on two sides and that's where we stay. Nothing happens. We don't ever work towards a solution. You know what I mean? And I think great art is supposed to make you talk and it's supposed to make you think. It's supposed to make you emote and, and you know, talk to the person next to you and go, how did you feel about this? Because this is how I felt about it and realize somebody else may see it from a completely different angle than what you saw. And you're watching the same thing, you know? Well, that's all very intelligent, uh, Sean. <laughs> very, you know, very thoughtful. But I was just about to say that I'm yeah. expecting that uh, Dr. Brown's character might turn into a, a bit like Dean Wormer on uh, Animal House. <laughs> I mean, the second episode, she brings in this guy with the beard and the ponytail who's very yeah. mysterious, who's doing her dirty work. And I thought it, it reminded me of uh, Animal House where at, at one point uh, Dean Wormer says – Put Niedermeyer on it. Put that little shit <laughs> Niedermeyer on it. You know, and I just thought, yep. okay, you know, because clearly this is a woman who can fight fire with fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I expect she will get down and as dirty as uh, the oh, vice yeah, principals, right? She is not backing down. No, I'm that's what I figured. Her. And she's a brilliant, brilliant actor. Brilliant actor. And do you have scenes with her as the series goes on? I don't. I think so. I think all of us at some point in the we know we all interact, so yeah, I think everybody does. Yeah. So I was I was just reading that the the, the series had a, a screened a, a preview reel at uh, Comic Con this past week. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah, I, I didn't go, but I saw that. Yeah, they they did screen at Comic Con and at South by Southwest as well. Hmm. Yeah. And so the series has shot a second season, but but it's going to be two and done. Is that correct? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, Danny and his crew, the whole Rough House crew, Jody Hill and and uh, David Gordon Green and, and 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 all their writers, they do sometimes write with the intent of just kind of let's just hit it and and that's it. But I don't know. I, I do know that you know when we first came on board, it was written a certain way, ended a certain way, and then it as things do, they morph, they change, they grow. So. You never know. You know. All I know is we've shot two seasons, and that's where we are right now. So you've got two seasons worth of paychecks. Tell me, <laughs> how is it? How is it? How is it affecting your uh, marketability uh, in Hollywood now? Have you? Do, you've got clearly you've got a reel now to show that it's, yeah. is far more developed than what you had. Um, yeah. You, you know. Uh, um, it, it obviously, obviously, it, it gives you just just alone saying that you're on a an HBO half hour comedy that's that's you know that, that that's top tier in in Hollywood um it definitely increases your profile where before I booked it you know it, it it's for those who don't understand how you know how acting works out here it's uh when they tell you that everybody in LA is an actor they are not lying to you <laughs> everybody in LA is an actor and sometimes all you have to set you apart is what you've done what you're doing and uh, what you're creating, you know, on your own. So to have something like that attached to my name, it opens a lot of doors, you know, and I was able to get into a lot more rooms, um, you know, this past pilot season and got a great agency behind me. And my manager's always been the my same manager, uh, Tash Mosley Management, greatest manager ever. Um, and um, I was able to sign with a wonderful, wonderful agency and have great agents over there. And it definitely increases your profile, you know, and to, to be able to walk in a room and say that you're on a current HBO show, you know, and um, people pay attention. They do. And then it's up to you from there to show the talent that you've all always had, but now you're finally getting the chance to let some of it, you know, some of it come out. So it, it definitely helps. Well, and you've got <clears throat> you, two, two have aired. How many were there? 10? Were there 13? There is nine per season. Nine oh, episodes. Per season. Yeah. So you've got seven more to, to unspool for the first season, then mm-hmm. nine more then. So you've got, you know, the better part of two years of uh, this and all the reruns that, you know, because yeah. it airs round the clock on, you know, Mm-hmm. So that's good. Uh, so, is there a next project lined up? Do you know what you're doing next? I'm I'm mostly uh, yeah I'm I'm mostly more excited about writing my own work, creating my own work, being a member of a theater company, and always having that mindset. You know, we started a theater company with the idea that we couldn't wait around for anybody to give us any opportunities, and the, the opportunities that were being provided were, you know, somewhat 
typical of, of, you know, hey, we need, you know, somebody to play this role. Yeah. yeah. You know, so as a, you know, instead of waiting for something, we, we decided to start our own company and Bashir and I have our own web series that, that we had done. Um, it's called Make It Happen. You can find it on Vimeo. Um, we got about seven or eight episodes of, um, of that up on Vimeo. And being around that crew um, from, from Vice Principals, the whole Rough House team, I mean, they, they are a group of friends who started in North Carolina. You know, they didn't go to some huge school. They didn't go to a Strasburg or, or, you know, study overseas or go to, you know, NYU or whatever. Not to say anything about those top tier schools, but just, just for people who can relate to go, you don't have to do that to do this, Mm -hmm. you know, and these are a group of friends who believed in the talent that they had and, and created work and being around them. And they were so gracious when we were there on set, they, you know, I was on set even when I wasn't shooting, just trying to soak everything up and learning from them and learning from all the brilliant writers that they have. But, you know, it, it just sparked that idea and that hunger to continue to write. So I'm currently working on a, a feature that I think is going to be great writing that and writing, a, trying to write a show at the same time. And, you know, I have a wonderful agency that once it's done, I can sit it on their desk. Um, another friend of mine has approached me with, possibly playing one of the craziest roles I've ever seen. But um, if you've ever seen a film, it's a very cult-type film. It's called The FP. You can find it on iTunes. It's by Jason Trost. He's a crazy, crazy director and writer. But he's got this crazy film. He wrote a sequel, and he approached me about playing the villain in the second in the second, um, second movie. So there are things on the books, and... Some things I'm very excited about, but mostly I am excited about creating my own work. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, folks, listen, you can watch Sean McKinney. Uh, steal, <laughs> he will steal scenes from Danny McBride and Walton Goggins in the new HBO sitcom Vice Principals. It's uh, Sundays at 10.30 p.m. Uh, do you have a website? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Sheon305. That's S H E A U N. And most people are going to go, that sounds like Sean. It's not Sean. (laughs) Sheon. You know, (laughs) and you can find me on Instagram, Sheon McKinney, and Facebook, Sheon McKinney. And again, go on to Vimeo.com. You can find Make It Happen and watch our our web show. And groundupandrising.org. If you want to see great theater in South Florida, go support. Excellent. Well, uh, Sheon McKinney, I am so happy to see you doing well. And finally, getting your due. Uh, it, I told you it's a it's it's great for me to have people come back on the show, even after this length of time, and see that things are on the rise. So good for you, and uh, thanks for joining us, Mr. Media, today. Ah, uh, thank you, man. Anytime, I appreciate it. before a studio audience full of men and women who blame everything that went wrong in their lives on their high school principal, and I'm looking at you, James Salvatore, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida.